Beloveds, I have to admit, I have a love-hate relationship with Ecclesiastes. I love the wisdom tradition, but I wrestled with this text a lot for this morning's sermon, so will you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you for the expansiveness of your grace that you would invite us to wrestle with your word, that we may be set free. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, creator God, my rock and my redeemer, amen. As I said, I do love Ecclesiastes, but I really wrestled particularly with the portion of this morning's reading where it says that there is a season for everything, that there is a time for every matter under the sun, under heaven. I wrestled because I'm uncomfortable with the notion that a time for hate and a time for war is ever just a given. As a Christian, as a pastor, as the Minister of Justice, Advocacy, and Change here at the Riverside Church, I believe that to pave the way towards God's justice, we must always be moving towards peace, towards love, towards healing. That's the heaven here on earth goal that I want to work towards. So I don't think there should be any room or any space for anything else but peace and love. Amen? And I know, I know that progress is often slow moving, so peace isn't going to be achieved all at once. I know God's movement in the world takes time, and as I wait for God's justice to roll down, I take hope and inspiration from Martin Luther King's quote. I'm sure you all know it. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I hold on to this idea, believing that our work in the long run is a progressive pursuit of justice. But by my observation, you know what it feels like? At least to me, it feels as though this long moral arc of the universe, it seems as though it's taken a sharp detour. Let me explain. In the United States, we have seen so much progress in civil rights, in women's rights, in marriage equality, but we've seen the rights of several communities lately who have been marginalized throughout history come under attack. And we've seen a double down on legislation to limit their right to flourish. In the summer of 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, I felt hopeful around all the conversations about racial bias and the value of equity, diversity, and inclusion. I felt like maybe we were making some progress forward. But over the last 12 months, I've seen the value of diversity tank with the banning of books about gender expression and sexuality. I've seen this in the narrative of fear surrounding critical race theory, and most recently, in the elimination of affirmative action in higher education. Added to that, I've seen a sharp detour in justice in the changing legislation that has threatened all of our individual rights to bodily autonomy, from abortion rights to the right to gender-affirming health care being taken all across the nation. We've seen corporations and our leaders ignore decades of science and research connecting the burning of fossil fuels with global warming. And we are at a tipping point this summer, facing the highest temperatures in history. I see someone fanning at the back there, so it's not just me, right? And yet we continue to fight a losing battle against our leaders who choose profit over the state of our climate. 
We saw massive steps back, even here in New York City. While safety net programs were put in place during the pandemic to keep New Yorkers afloat, these have now expired. And now the city is facing a cost of living and affordable housing crisis. Statistics show nearly 80% of New Yorkers do not make enough to meet the minimum cost of living in this state. And New Yorkers are not isolated in this experience, but many other people around the, this nation are experiencing this. Many people in countries around the world are in this same situation. The everyday person has to work so hard just to keep up with life, just to get ahead that little bit. If not just to get ahead, we need to work so hard just to survive. Now added to the everyday pressures of just surviving, we've similarly been spinning our wheels to push the needle of justice forward but we keep facing multiple setbacks. And I often ask myself, lamenting to God, asking, why is this happening? How can this be happening? How is it possible that from all angles, it looks as though we are moving backwards? The author of this morning's passage, the author of Ecclesiastes is a wise, sage, a philosopher whom biblical scholars call Koheleth, which means teacher in Hebrew. He was speaking to people who were feeling this similar sense of overwhelm. He writes, all things are wearisome, more than one can express. But what was there to be wearisome about in his time? So a little history lesson. The ancient Jews at the time were under Ptolemaic rule. The Ptolemies were Greek rulers from Egypt. So they were foreign rulers. Their era was marked with advances across many sectors. So while they weren't leaders in philosophy or art like the Greeks, they were leading the way in advancements in military tactics, in commerce, trade, and finance, and even in agriculture. On the surface, at first glance, this empire sounds like a thriving and successful one. But thriving and successful were not words to describe the living conditions of their subjects. As you can imagine, such advancements are only made possible on the backs of an exploited class who have been overworked, underpaid, often under substandard working conditions, with no safety net whatsoever. The teacher, the Koheleth, has made a number of observations in the decades of Ptolemaic rule that he has lived through. So looking back on his life, he has seen his community overwork themselves under exploitative conditions. He has seen them toil under the sun, Season after season, both landowners and workers, he has seen them succumb to overwork in their effort to try to get ahead and secure their own financial stability, to try to keep up with the empire's growing economy. But he has seen that their efforts have been futile. They do backbreaking labor, planting and building to avoid loss, but only to find that the reality of the wickedness of the Ptolemaic Empire is that they can never get ahead because the empire will pluck up that which the workers have planted. They will build up their wealth. They will gather and hoard commodities. They will laugh and dance, enjoying their gains. All the while, his community break down from physical and mental exhaustion. All the while, his people weep and mourn from the death and suffering that they have endured under such an oppressive system. 
The Koheleth observes that their toil to try to get ahead is pointless. Vanity of vanities, he calls it. Like trying to, as the Spanish proverb that I've put in your bulletin this morning says, trying to get up early to hasten the dawn. He says that it's as pointless as trying to chase the sun or trying to fill the sea. For Kohelet, the mental and physical stress to get ahead is pointless in trying to chase wealth, to hasten a good life for yourself or for your own personal gain. And so he calls out his peers in this text. He calls out the peers in his community who are fellow aristocrats, business owners, landowners. He says to them that they're supposed to do differently, to act as righteous children of God, to do justly in the midst of adversity. Instead, he says this in the passage, in the place of justice, wickedness was there. In the place of righteousness, wickedness was there as well. So he's saying that their participation, instead of doing justly, their participation in the wickedness of overwork and exploitation for their own individual gain has made them no better than the Ptolemaic Empire. They've chosen wickedness by normalizing overwork and exhaustion. Instead of working in solidarity with their workers to do differently. Now, here in the United States, we are not strangers to overwork, right? In fact, sometimes I think we take pride in our busyness by calling our overwork and exhaustion drive for success. You can admit it if you've said that before. But the reality is grim. As a nation, researchers have found that 89% of workers have experienced burnout in the last year. Burnout and stress are the symptoms of the injustices that we are experiencing as we try to keep up and try to survive. As Koheleth has suggested, Overwork has not set us free. It has not made our lives better. It has certainly not moved the needle of justice forward. Instead, in our drive to fight for one particular cause, for one justice issue, we have missed how one justice issue impacts another. In our strain to uplift one marginalized community, we have pitted other marginalized communities against them. In our over-fatigue around one issue, we've settled for getting things right, right now, but have missed the opportunity to make things right for the long haul. And I wonder, beloveds, if this is the vanity of vanities Koheleth was talking about. And I wonder if this is why we have seen the moral arc of justice take a sharp detour in recent years. I wonder if this might be one of the reasons we continue to find ourselves trapped in a cycle of injustice season after season. Koheleth offers us a solution to being set free from this holding pattern of injustice, which has to do with us behaving radically different from the ways of the empire. So instead of celebrating drive and overwork, Koheleth advises us in chapter three, verses 12 and 13, that it is better to be happy, to enjoy ourselves, to eat and enjoy the fruits of our labor. And I'm gonna be honest right now, this is where I really struggled. I found this such a struggle as an immigrant and as an Asian woman because I watched my parents work overtime 
and work weekends just to give me a leg up when I was growing up in British colonized Hong Kong where we were ethnic minorities. Even watching how hard it was for my parents and how much pressure they put on me and even knowing that all I wished for was for, our, for us to spend more time together as a family, I've repeated the same behavior just to try to give my kids a leg up here in the United States. But it hasn't gotten me further. It's only impacted my mental health and my physical health. Our bodies are not meant to work this way. Our bodies are not meant to function like machines. My body was crying out for rest. And rest is radical in a world of productivity. I'm going to say it again, beloveds. Rest is radical in a world of productivity. Joy, Sabbath, and rest are spiritual practices that defy empire's dependency on the productivity of our bodies. When we rest our bodies, when we allow one another to rest, we are resisting empire's exploitation of our bodies. Joy and Sabbath and rest are gifts that we can extend to one another in an act of solidarity. Rest and joy are acts of resistance against the wickedness of overwork that we have put on ourselves and on one another. So I just need you to tell your neighbor right now, neighbor, you deserve rest. Because rest is a radical act of resistance. Pursuing Sabbath, rest and joy as a collective in solidarity with one another will bring us closer to heaven on earth even more than overwork ever can. It is a way of living that God has already put in our minds, like the passage says. It is what we are collectively crying out for when we're experiencing burnout and stress. Perhaps what we need to do is to remind ourselves that God's promise for heaven here on earth was never just for one person or one community or one group but that God calls us to participate in heaven here on earth to make it possible for the entire collective. So how we orient ourselves in this world and how we pursue justice has to be towards heaven here on earth for every single person, not just one group, not even just for only the bodies in this church. We have to set our eyes on heaven here on earth for everyone. And if we do that, then we have to ask ourselves, is it just to place migrants in temporary shelters? Or would heaven on earth look closer to long-term, stable, affordable housing that would actually go to benefit everyone? including asylum seekers, including people who experience house, housing insecurity, and everyone who struggles to afford rent every month? Wouldn't the relief of affordable housing allow for collective joy and rest? We must ask ourselves, is it just to limit the celebration of queer joy to Pride Month alone? Or should heaven on earth look closer to the unapologetic and free celebration of queer joy everywhere and every single day? Whether it's in the safety and privacy of someone's home or in the mobile gas station or in our schools. We must ask ourselves, is banning guns alone enough to keep guns off our streets? Or, should, or would having access to mental health care too, 
bring us closer to heaven here on earth. We're getting access to basic resources, getting support from the collective in education, in our workplace, and in our homes. Would a more holistic approach allow for us to choose rest and Sabbath and joy over all forms of violence? In closing, I think it's important to make, take note of how Kaleleth takes inspiration from nature and how he delivers wisdom in the people. Koheleth takes inspiration from the ease in which the natural world conforms to the seasons. And perhaps he's inviting us to do the same. Perhaps we can find hope by moving slowly and intentionally as nature does, following pathways that promote growth collectively. Perhaps instead of turning away from what makes us uncomfortable, we can find hope in part by listening to people that we have typically silenced. Perhaps we can experience growth together from hearing from their stories, and perhaps it might draw us closer to connecting with their experiences. Perhaps hope can be found when we aren't so quick to war and fight with people whom we disagree with. Can we believe God's promise that something beautiful might blossom instead, where beneath our disagreements, we might find common ground, common ground that may be the foundation to building solidarity together. Perhaps hope can be found when we have the courage in our differences to face these various seasons of adversity together instead of in conflict with one another. Even if we've been taught that in this world, it's an every man for himself world, what if we did differently and move through rough times together in doing so, by moving in solidarity with one another, we can be reassured of God's promise that this season of hardship too shall pass. And together we can follow God faithfully into the next season where our call for collective healing starts, where we can dare and dream to usher in the promise of joy for all of humanity, for all of creation that comes in the morning. Amen.